Homo sapiens, who are we? Where did we come from? In the last chapter, we took a look at Saul Hill Anthropus, Chetensis, and Aurora Tugenensis. In chapter three, we will continue our quest to learn more about our ancient ancestors through paleoanthropology. But before we resume our quest, let's digress. Let's take a moment to look at the actual mechanisms of evolution. How do living creatures evolve? Why do they evolve? These questions are fundamental to understanding the nature of life. Not only do these questions apply to life, but to the very nature of the universe itself. From the moment of the Big Bang, some 14 billion years in the past, there seems to be one immutable law to which nothing is immune. All things must change. Nothing stands still. The very fabric of space-time is expanding. Our universe expands and evolves. Galaxies evolve, stars evolve, star systems evolve, forming planets and bodies constantly in collision. Planets evolve in this chaotic environment, bombarded by smaller bodies as they are stressed by radiation and gravity. Our Earth revolves around the Sun, creating changing seasons. The Earth spins on its axis with a slow procession that impacts climate over thousands of years. The tectonic plates of the Earth inch almost imperceptibly gliding over the Earth's molten mantle like giant conveyor belts. Along the boundaries of these tectonic plates, we find regions of mountain building and subduction where earthquakes caused by friction between the plates rattle the earth and volcanoes can erupt in cataclysmic fashion, affecting life for thousands of miles in all directions. Beneath the oceans, we find thermal vents along the boundaries of the tectonic plates which give rise to colonies of life that derive their sustenance from chemosynthetic bacteria, just as creatures on the surface of the earth are dependent on photosynthetic life for sustenance. This incremental changing of the Earth impacts life. Over eons, mountains arise only to be worn down. Oceans and lakes form and disappear. Forests arise and die. Once fertile, vibrant landscapes become desolate deserts. These changing landscapes impact weather patterns and climate. This slow, inexorable change impacts life in all its forms. Life either adapts or goes extinct. Natural selection in action. But by what mechanism does life change and adapt? The answer is basically DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, a molecule that functions as an information handling system for creating life. We can think of DNA as being akin to a computer code. Binary computer code uses a series of zeros and ones to store information and allows computers to boot up and perform all kinds of marvelous functions using vast arrays of these two numbers. Similarly, DNA uses four nucleotides to encode the information for creating and sustaining life. Adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. All known life forms on Earth are coded for using varying combinations of these four nucleotides. DNA is extremely proficient at storing and encoding information. If it wasn't, life would be pretty messy. But every so often, a mistake creeps into the system. We would label this mistake a mutation. These encoding mistakes or mutations can be beneficial, harmful, or have no impact at all on an organism. During the process of sexual conception, a new organism is formed from the mixing of the DNA of its parents, half from the mother and half from the father. This mixing results in a new organism which is unique at some level, but still very much like its parents. This continuous mixing of DNA with the possibility of a mutation creeping into the process makes life very dynamic. But no matter how dynamic this process is, once the individual organism is conceived, its genetics are set. It can't change. To understand evolution clearly, we must think in terms of a population of organisms. To make an analogy, let's think of organisms as expressions of a collective pool of DNA or a gene pool. This gene pool is constantly changing and evolving through the mixing and mutating of DNA. The gene pool thus represents a range of possibilities and characteristics which are reflected in the individuals. Some individuals may be a bit bigger than the norm, some smaller, some faster, some slower, some smarter, some not so smart, some with sharp vision, some not, some mothers very protective of their young, some not, a range of possibilities. Under optimal conditions, they may all thrive. But what if something changes? The forest you live in begins to thin out. The distance between trees becomes greater. Water resources become farther away. Protective cover becomes harder to find. 
the predator that stalks you now has more time to run you down. From the standpoint of the gene pool, if you are a little faster than your buddy, you survive while he or she is eaten. That individual no longer contributes to the gene pool, whereas you continue and your genes stay in the pool. Over many generations, this constant pressure on the gene pool will likely lead to a population of faster and more agile organisms, or smarter, or more cautious. As a consequence, the population of your predator may adapt by becoming faster and more agile or smarter. So evolution goes. Those organisms best suited to withstand the environmental pressures will be those that make up the gene pool and thus pass on their genes to the generations to come. Now take this a step further. Events occur in the environment which split the gene pool. A river grows wider and the populations on each side no longer mix. We now have two separate gene pools which undergo change and mutation isolated from each other. The two gene pools drift apart. The organisms as expressions of the gene pool begin to take on new characteristics. Given enough time and separation, the genetic distance between the two gene pools may be such that new species are formed. This is essentially how evolution works. A dynamic gene pool is encoded for by DNA. This DNA is constantly mixing, occasionally mutating while being selectively culled by natural environmental pressures. Out of this dynamic mix arise organisms best suited for the conditions at hand. Thus Mother Nature, not through design, not through foresight, but by carefully rubbing and blowing on her dice, plays her magnificent game of chance and we and all we see are the result. A bit of skill and a bit of luck tempered and honed by the laws of chemistry and physics. We are not here because Mother Nature is a designer. We are here because Mother Nature is a gambler. Returning to paleoanthropology, we will continue our quest to learn more about our ancient ancestors on the family tree Homo. In chapter two, we looked at Sahelanthropus and Auroran, which took us some six million years back into the past. As we move forward in time, leaving the Miocene epoch and entering the Pliocene epoch at about 5.3 million years in the past, we begin to enter a more fossil-rich area of paleoanthropology. The family tree Homo begins to get a bit more crowded. Let's take a moment to look at our family tree. Sahil Anthropus and Auroran are two early ancestral possibilities which lie in the time frame of the theorized genetic split between the lineages of Homo and chimpanzee, this occurring around six million years in the past. As we move forward in time, we find Artipithecus cadaba at around 5.6 million years in the past. At around 4.4 million years in the past, we find Artipithecus ramidus. These members of the genus Artipithecus occur after the genetic split between the lineages of Homo and chimpanzee. What role Artipithecus plays on the family tree Homo is still being researched. Moving forward to around 4 million years in the past, we come to the genus Australopithecus. The Australopithecines represent an important group on the family tree Homo. Included in this important genus, we find Australopithecus anamensis, Australopithecus afarensis, and Australopithecus africanus. The Australopithecines may have given rise to the genus Homo, but the exact role is still being debated. When we come to around 2.5 million years in the past, we find the first member of the genus Homo, Homo habilis. Homo habilis is the first human ancestor associated with stone tools. Around 1.8 million years in the past, we find Homo erectus, also known as Homo ergaster. Homo erectus represents a direct ancestor on the family tree. Homo erectus is the first member of the genus Homo to migrate out of Africa into Europe and Asia. Homo erectus gave rise to Homo heidelbergensis, who in turn gave rise to Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens. As we look at our family tree, it is important to remember that we are dealing with dynamic populations that are slowly changing and adapting to variations in their environment over thousands and millions of years. The fossils that have been found represent but a small snapshot in time of a much greater and far more complex picture. There is always a desire to make the complex succinct so that it may be more easily grasped. But let's never lose sight of the fact that the tale of the family tree Homo is a very complex and multifaceted story. We will continue our quest to learn more about this amazing story in Chapter 4 with the help of Paleoanthropology.